Hello, everyone. Welcome to Hyperspace on the Dark Matter Digital Network. I'm your host, Solaris Blue Raven. I want to thank everybody for tuning in this evening, and a special thank you to webmaster and producer Keith Rowland. And my special guest this evening is Dennis Stone. And Dennis Stone grew up at America's Stonehenge and has been involved with the site for the last 55 years and has met a variety of researchers. Also a full-time airline captain, Dennis has traveled extensively around the world to other ancient sites in Europe and North America. He has been on numerous television and radio shows since 1970. And when he is not flying, Dennis spends his time at America's Stonehenge, where his wife, Pat, manages the day-to-day -day operations of the site. Their son, Kelsey, who is an engineer, has taken an interest in ongoing research. And their website is StonehengeUSA.com. And we're very happy to have Dennis. Welcome to the show tonight. Hi, Dennis. Hi, Solaris and Keith. Thank you for having me on this evening. Well, thank you for joining us. It's a pleasure to have you on. Welcome. And I'm very excited to talk to you about all of this information pertaining to Stonehenge USA. So so I want to get started with you insofar as what year did you personally discover this site, and, and when was it originally discovered? Um, well, uh, actually, my family, my dad is the one that really uh, found out about the site, and it was 60 years ago this year, this summer, as a matter of fact, so we're kind of celebrating the 60th year of our families kind of discovering the site. At that time, I was only one years old, so, huh. <laughs> you know, so I was pretty young at the time. Uh, but my dad didn't fall with us. He happened to hear it on a radio show, just like we're doing right now, and the show was all about our place called America Stonehenge today, and it had different names in the past. He had never heard of it before, and it was a show called Yankee Yarns. Alton Hall Blackington was a show host, and they were talking about this site. Uh, and it was a Friday night show, and so it really got his interest. He only lived about eight miles away and ne had never heard about it. And the show is out of Boston. It's one of the biggest radio stations in the Northeast. And, um, you know, and so, you know, it was kind of a kind of neat to hear about the site just down the road from him that that he didn't know about, you know. So mm -hmm. so, it's, so we've been in for about uh, 60 years now. Wow. And so did he purchase the land, or how is that working? Yeah, what happened was he heard it on the radio show, and then he saw it in a New Hampshire Profile magazine at a barber shop waiting to have his hair cut, and he opened up the magazine, and there's a whole story. Actually, it was a three-year-old magazine. It was a 1952 issue, so this is 1955. And he, he said, "Yeah, I just heard about this on the radio, and there it is, right in the right in the magazine article." So he asked if he could keep the uh, magazine from the barber, and he he said yes, and he took it home with him. And the following weekend, my aunt and uncle and a bunch of friends were playing cards, I guess poker or whatever, and they used to get together on Saturday nights. And my dad put the uh, magazine article on the paper on the table so everybody could see it, you know, during a break. And asked if anybody had, you know, been there or heard about it. And my aunt and uncle said, oh, well, we used to go there in the 1930s on our bicycles, you know, and pedal down there about 10 miles or so. And uh, we used to picnic up there. And so my dad goes, you did. So the next day, I think they went down there on the following Sunday, and uh, the four of them, and they actually found the place. So my dad, um, at that point, he um, found out who the owner was. It was a gentleman named Malcolm Pearson. And Malcolm had inherited the site from uh, the original researcher of the site from the 1930s. That's when the research work began. Uh, a gentleman named William Goodwin from Connecticut had actually purchased a site to explore it, to research it, to study it. And he had a theory that the uh, Vikings had built the site, but when they hired a crew to uncover the site, it was covered with a lot of debris and brush and trees. You couldn't really make out all of it at that time. It was, it was kind of a poor state of repair. Um, so as they began uncovering it in the 1930s, he said, well, this is not a Viking settlement. It looks more like an Irish Caldy monk monastery, you know, built about a thousand years ago was his theory. Mm -hmm. And um, Malcolm Pearson's actually the gentleman that introduced him to the site. Malcolm uh, just died just a couple of years ago at 99 years old. And he wow. was actually involved with it for probably 80 years, I guess, this type of idea of ancient sites, you know, in, in the Northeast, you know. Mm -hmm. So my dad met Malcolm Pearson and began talking about maybe opening it up as a museum attraction to the public in the late 1950s. And by 1958, he worked on an agreement. He leased the property. He uh, opened it to the public, and my dad continued the research on it. And by 1965, my dad actually raised enough capital to actually purchase it from Malcolm Pearson. And they remained good friends, and Malcolm remained kind of involved with it until his death just a couple of years ago. So, uh, you know, it's been a long, long time of research and study and a lot of people involved with it. Uh, my dad worked at AT&T, Bill Laboratories as an engineer, full-time just like to work as a pilot. And my son, Kelsey's kind of involved. He's an engineer also, a mechanical, uh, electrical mechanical engineer. So I mean, he has a deep interest in, in the site, too. Mm -hmm. So it's a lot of kind of generational. Right. It's beautiful. You know, it's, it's a real blessing. What, what synchronicity? What are the chances of all that unfolding? 
Okay. And I named it Stone, too. So I know, noticed that. <laughs> Synchronicity, <laughs> right? Yeah. It had to be. <laughs> it's just fascinating. Well, well it's real interesting, oh. and I, I know that I'm really happy that you opened it up for, for the public right now, too. And that's, that's really nice. They can go in and take a good look at everything. So um, insofar as the aging goes, now, now apparently there's an estimate that it's 4,000 years old. Is that correct, this site? Yes, 4,000 years old. That is correct, yeah. Okay. And, and how did they come to that conclusion? Well, um, they took, uh, starting in 1966 through the mid-1990s, they were able to obtain charcoal samples to radiocarbon date, mm -hmm. as well as a piece of tree root. So they did radiocarbon dating on the site, um, starting in 1966. Um, and the main site, what we call the main site, is about one acre of where most of the stone structures are located. Um, these big underground chambers, you know, drains, cottings, closets, all built out of stone with huge stone roofs on top. And it looks like a megalithic type site. And mm -hmm. megalithic, you know, in Western Europe, there are 50,000 megalithic sites besides Stonehenge, which is a, the best known megalith. I think it's the most visited megalithic site in the world. They get over a million visitors a year. Mm -hmm. But they're all different shapes and sizes. And uh, if you travel throughout all the British Isles and actually into Russia, India, China, South Korea, uh, Korea had about 120,000 megalithic type sites. You'll see a resemblance to some of the structures at America's Stonehenge. And um, so... The carbon dating was of a uh, uh, 1967. We got a piece of root growing through what we call the Chamber of Ruins. It's one of the. Uh, it's a chamber. It's rectangular in shape. It's right dead center, pretty much in the middle of the uh, site. And a root had grown through the wall. And by the 1930s, when Mr. Goodwin was there, they took photographs. Malcolm Pearson, actually a, a professional photographer, which is great. You know, we had him to record everything. Uh, he actually worked for a couple different businesses as professional photographer. So he was up there photographing before Goodwin, during, and after Goodwin's time. You know, some people say, well, maybe Mr. Goodwin built all, the whole thing. And we know that's not true. He, uh, he did, he did um, excavate it. He did restore some of the walls. And then he had his theories about the Irish monks, you know. Uh, but this chamber uh, is really important, too. It uh, has a seven- to eight-ton roof slab that has fallen into the structure. But in 1967, they were actually able to excavate next to the north wall, and they found a piece of that root. In the 1930s, the stump was pretty decayed. It was a white pine, I guess, and they couldn't really do tree ring dating on it. And the important thing is that the wall was there first, and then the tree grew next to the structure, and the roots penetrated the walls. So in that order, you know, the walls first and the trees later. They estimated its age by its state of decay and by its diameter to sometime in the 1600s. And when we were able to get a piece of that route in 1967, we sent it to Geochrome Laboratories, and they were in Cambridge, Massachusetts at that time, and they did the radio dating, and they came up with a date of about 1690 A.D. So they were pretty right. close in their guess, right. but it did put it before the Patty family. There was a family that bought the land in 1734, and sometime after that, we built a house on top of this property and kind of caused a lot of damage to the site. Mm. And the house finally burned down in 1850. Uh, yeah, 1855, I guess, the house uh, caught on fire and it was uh, heavily damaged, I guess. But a lot of people said, oh, it's Patty's Caves. The Patty family built it. But they were actually shoemakers. And we have a pretty good historical record of the Patty family going back actually into the 1600s. And uh, they were shoemakers. They had domesticated animals. And the only thing they really did up there is they took advantage of a, a large rectangular area to build a wooden house over. And unfortunately, they had quarrymen up there during the 1800s removing the site, causing a lot of damage. So what we did with the carbon dating is we showed that the grandfather named Seth that bought the property in 1734 could not have built the, the, uh, the site because the site predates that time period by about 50 or 60 years. Mm -hmm. It's kind of close, but it still predates the Patty family. So... That structure was there before the Patties. 1969, they dug down further in that same area on the north wall, we call it, of that structure, and they obtained a date of uh, 3,000 years before present, plus or minus a couple of centuries. And in 1971, they continued uh, excavating that area to the bedrock, actually, and they got charcoal that dated to 4,000 years old, plus or minus a couple of centuries. Mm -hmm. So we go back to about 4,000 years, we think. But... Um, the astronomy actually supports that. The astronomical research we did starting in 1967 mm -hmm. through the late 1970s actually supports that because our alignments uh, with the sun, moon, and stars actually don't quite work today. They actually work about uh, 1800 B.C. because of the Earth's tilt, it's changing very slowly. Mm -hmm. And um, so that was good. So we had the carbon dating in 1971. It showed about 4,000 years old. And in 1977, when we got 
the results of a survey that was conducted from 1973 to 1977, and it was sent to the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics in Cambridge, Mass. And they said, well, if it was used for astronomical purposes, you'd have to go back to almost 2000 BC, about 1800 BC, plus or minus about 200 years for these alignments to work correctly. And um, more recently, a Penn State uh, astronomer, Aki astronomer from Penn State, uh, he unfortunately passed away a few years ago. He was just getting into this whole project. He, you know, more research on this. He had a sudden, you know, heart attack, which is sad. Mm-hmm. He uh, found one of our star alignments, and that star alignment called uh, the star called Iser would actually align with a 14-foot, uh, what we call uh, monolith or men here. It's like a long stone, and it has a slope to it, which a lot of like some of the the uh, the uh, stones you see at Stennis in Scotland or uh, Callanash over in Scotland. The same kind of shaped stone. 14 feet tall, and it actually was a polar grazing alignment with the star Isa, and it had about a 100-year window, and that would work on that particular stone due to the Earth's tilt again changing very slowly mm-hmm. uh, in the precession of the epochs. So it was actually the precessional effect that would affect that, actually, that 26,000-year uh, precessional cycle. Mm-hmm. So maybe about 4,000 years. Wow. That's fascinating. That's incredible. Yeah. And how, lar- how large is the site itself? Um, how, how, ta- how big are we talking about? Yeah, the site, well, the main site, uh, where most of the structures are about one acre, and it has a chain link fence that Mr. Goodwin put up in 1937 that's still there, and it's a 80-year-old fence, and it's incredible shape, you know. Uh, they don't make them like that anymore. But um, outside of that, Mr. Goodwin was aware of the walls and some of the standing stones, and he purchased about 15 acres. Today, um, since the 1950s, my dad was able to uh, basically buy the whole hilltop. I think the last purchase was when I was still in high school in the early 1970s, it's approximately 110 acres, so it's pretty much the whole entire hill. So we wanted to protect the protect the whole thing, and then we realized that there are other artifacts and the structures and the quarry sites out there, and a lot of things out there we wanted to protect. We just didn't want houses popping up all over the hilltop, you know, and it would ruin the alignments for sure. You know, you wouldn't be able to see the alignments through the houses, you know. So we wanted to protect the entire hill. Right, that's a smart <clears throat> move, definitely. So, insofar as the site itself goes, so with all of that property and all those acres, it's possible that maybe there are some other things that are buried, or no? Have you have you done any extra digging? So that's a great question. Yeah, the digging began with Mr. Goodwin in 1937, and so it's about 80 years of digging. But actually, not every year have we done excavations. The research has been going on for 80 years. Uh, they've they've done um, between Mr. Goodwin and all the following researchers. Uh, they probably have only excavated, if you put all the test kits together, all the excavations, probably a little over an acre. So maybe about 1% of the land has actually been, you know, looked at, you know, by digging, you know. And mm-hmm. uh, we, but, so it's not a small percentage, but we have run ground penetration radar over a lot of the hill, too. Uh, it's manu- one of the manufacturers is, was a neighbor of ours right down the street about a half a mile away. And they used to bring their equipment up in the mid-90s. So that's another good way to look for things, you know, in the ground would actually, without disturbing it, actually. Mm-hmm. You know, it's pretty neat, pretty right. neat technology. So what did you find with the ground penetrating radar? Did you find anything interesting or? Well, uh, they found a couple of uh, fire pits, uh, which is kind of neat. People were building fires on top of the hill. Mm-hmm. Um, we ran it over some of the drains just to see what the drain. We have uh, actually the people at both the site actually engineered a complete set of underground storm drains uh, after the snow melts during heavy rain. These uh, stone lines, actually, they're like parallel walls with large capstones on top and about big enough for um, a kid to crawl through, and some of them go 75 feet. Um, and they keep the hilltop dry, uh, of the site dry. They are, I guess they're afraid of um, puddles everywhere, you know, because the bedrock doesn't absorb the water, so they channeled everything up there. And um, so uh, the whole site has a, is engineered with these underground drains, which is pretty neat. It's... Um, and it, it, almost every structure has one leading from it. It's very unusual. You don't find that in typical colonial or post-colonial, you know, farms or, you know, houses or anything like that, you know. It's, it's right. pretty, a pretty neat thing it did. A lot of work went into it, actually. Oh, absolutely. Uh, yeah. Definitely. And yeah. also, you know, Mark Eddy pointed out, he, he just texted me, but he, he was pointing out the glacial cliff shelters on the property. Is that what you were talking about as well? Oh, yeah. That's one of the uh, interesting uh, parts of the hill. It's actually about maybe a thousand feet from the main site. It's to the west of the site. And it's still on our property. And my dad actually purchased that piece of land to protect that because in the 1950s, they were doing some excavations out there and they found uh, pottery. And the pottery was dated by its style 
Uh, they didn't use that thermal lesson. I think thermal lessons dating came in later anyway. It's a technique of dating pottery, but they used a stylistic dating. And it was middle woodland period pottery, and they felt it was dated between 2,500 years old and 2,000 years old. And it was a glacial cliff shell that probably used during the summer months because the winds will come out of Canada from the northwest and they'll blow over a river that's down in the valley down there just below the hill called the Spigot River, which is a tributary of one of the larger rivers in New England called the Merrimack River. So the northwestern wind winds will keep you nice and cool, kind of air conditioning in the summer. Mm-hmm. On the, um, in the parking lot area, a parking lot where you come in and where our visitors come in, um, and we opened up in 1958 because we didn't know we had... Um, these um, this interesting uh, find actually was found in 1995 when they're doing some shovel test pits. They found the remains of a wigwam, which is about 30 feet across. Uh, they found all the little post molds all around in a big circle. And in the middle of this uh, wigwam site, they found two fire pits. And these were sent to Woods Holes. I think it was Woods Wood Hole uh, Oceanographic down in Massachusetts. And they did three uh, particle acceleration tests for us. And... Um, and I believe two of them came from that, if I recall. They were one dated 2,000 years old, and the other one dated about 1,700 years old. And they actually found the grease still in the soil from when they were cooking. It hadn't uh, biodegraded after all these years. And that can be dated also by radiocarbon-14 uh, method. On the other side of the parking lot, they were doing another shovel test pit, and they found um, the remains of another cooking rack. So the parking lot area, I think, was actually a village. And um, it was probably their winter quarters, and they would go to the cliff in the summer, and then they would go across the hill or into the uh, wigwam, and it's actually a sheltered area. So, um, and that dated around 2,000 to 2,500 years. So that was a very interesting find. But the glacial cliff shelf needs more exploration. It's a, it's a beautiful area. There's all sorts of quarry sites out there, too, where they're actually quarrying these very large uh, slabs, mm-hmm. multi-ton slabs, and they're still out there today. They didn't actually move them. They actually raised them off the bedrock, propped them with a stone, and then they left them. And we don't know what happened to these people. Like, why did they why did they give up this project? You know, what mm-hmm. made them go away? That's right. We just yeah. don't know. Good yeah. question. Yeah, what made them leave or move and migrate? You know, it's interesting. What kind of uh, rocks are we talking about over there? Um, and so far as the bedrock goes, is it quartz or what's it made out of? Yeah, does have quartz in it. Uh, there's quartz, uh, feldspar, mica, um, and it's called, um, uh, it has to, it's ganice. Or I've heard the word basket granite. Uh, it's um, it does come up in layers. It's foliated, so it can come up in layers, and that's good because that's how they uh, built the site. They were able to raise up very large pieces of this bedrock. And we had a gentleman join us in 1978. He's a master stonemason, a doctor of theology, and a doctor of historical anthropology. He goes to Scotland a lot, and he's worked on British megalithic sites and historic sites. But um, and he lives in New Hampshire also, and uh, he's one that really recognized how these. People quarried the stone, and they would raise the stones, and they would take and use a throwing stone or throwing hammer, a big piece of stone, to actually start shaping it. And then when they get the basic shape, they would use like a hammer stone, like bashing an arrowhead. It's called percussion flaking. Mm-hmm. And um, in these stones, and he identified the stones, and we keep finding more and more of these. My son found a bunch of them uh, three years ago. He was doing some more clearing on the astronomical alignments, and he came up across more of these propped up stones, you know, by man, so they've been artificially propped. And some of these things are several feet across, some way, you know, eight tons, ten tons, you know, five tons, and they're just sitting there. And it was kind of a kind of a surprise to us that there were that many. We knew there was probably a dozen or two, but we, we found so many, and we were wondering, you know, at that point, a couple of years ago, what type of plan did they have for this site, you know? Mm-hmm. How much larger were they going to build it? And then why did they abandon this during this work in progress, you know, just where they abandoned the whole thing. So right. Unless, kind of a big mystery to us. Yeah, it's almost, I wonder if somebody else took over. But, but what's really interesting also, did you find precious metals there as well? Um, no, in the, in the area, I uh, suppose there's a couple of silver mines. Uh, we haven't found anything on the hill. Uh, there is quartz crystal, though. The quartz crystal was found. Um, actually, we have two wells. These are stone mine wells. One's called the lower well. Mm-hmm. And that one has never been completely dug to the bottom. Um, it's located to the south of the site, outside the chain link fence, and it's actually an interesting area because there's a clay deposit right next to it. Uh, we found um, where they had like an open kiln for making pottery, and, and the clay, to, clay is pr- almost perfectly white in color. It's, you go through this mucky kind of soil, and when they excavate, it's very really dirty and uh, mucky, and then when they got down below that, it was almost like chalk white. It was like, wow, that's really... But in, that pottery at the cliff may have, in fact, 
been made right there, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but the Lowell well, we've never dug it down, so we don't know how old it is. We don't know who made it. Um, and when they tried to do it in the 1960s, I think, and in the 1980s, it, they hit the water level, and they didn't have any pumps to pump it out at that time. So someday, they will, if they continue down, they'll just have to pump the water out of it, you know, because actually the water comes from that uh, swampy area. There's a water table there, and it, it just fills it up, you know. It can get dangerous to it, so maybe someday they'll build. Uh, the upper well is the interesting one. It might actually be a mine shaft. It looks like a well, but there's no spring of water, and it. it's just a uh, snow melt in the uh, spring, and also when it rains out, it's right in the paddy area, and it's only a, a one rock width um, separating the well from the cellar hole with the paddies, you know, and actually we think it was an ancient court, yeah, but the paddies put the house over it. So mm -hmm. if the water ever got too high, it would just flood out the cellar. Like, why would you do that, you know? Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it makes how, no, sense. no, it doesn't. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Well, how deep was the well? How deep would you estimate it is? Yeah, that well up the upper well, we do know. The lower well, we do not know. And we're hoping the ground penetration radar might give us uh, an idea on that lower well. But it was the water, I guess, affects the radar signal, you know. So they weren't able to do that. That would have been interesting. And then we know what we're up against. But the upper well is about 23 feet deep. And I think the last five feet of it, some these people who made this actually quarried uh, the last five feet of it through solid bedrock. Yeah. And, what they, my dad found, and my dad cleaned it out in 1963 with a bunch of volunteers, you know, they had to go down into the well with a ladder and they have a bucket and a rope and pull all the stuff out and then eventually sift it and everything, but it was very monkey and everything. And what they found is no spring of water, but they found actually a vein of quartz crystals down there. And these quartz crystals are really beautiful, you know, they're, they're kind of opaque though. You can just almost see through them, you know, the light kind of comes through them, but they're very beautiful. We have them on display in the museum. And we, and we noticed a lot of the ancient sites around the world, including others in New England and our site. Uh, quartz seems to be a theme, you know, quartz right. and quartz crystal. Yeah, Very important, I think. You know? Yeah, amplification and resonation. Yeah, that's real interesting. I, I love quartz anyway, but I'm sure the vibration's really high with all of those crystals resonating over there. And plus, it was a ceremonial spot. Right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Was a ceremony. Yeah, we think it's, you're right. We think it was a ceremonial place, and quartz would play into that. And, you know, the hill is actually split in half. There's a uh, fault uh off the uh, east coast, uh, about 20 miles from us, called the Clinton Newbury Fault. And uh, what kind of, an, I guess, a tributary, if you will, or it's actually the whole, our whole hill is split in half. It's like a joint that goes right through the entire hill. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like an earthquake fault line right through the center of the site. And the whole hilltop is actually, uh, it's one part of the hill's moved west a little bit, and the other side is moved east. And they actually took advantage of this when they were making some of these big uh, slabs, because one inch was already made by nature by this cracking of the uh, a, a beautiful straight line across the hill, so they actually quarried some of the stones next to this fall, and one edge is nice and straight and everything, you know, so it must work for them to do, I guess. Mm -hmm. And one of the stones ended up in a chamber called the Double Solar. It's actually the only two-story structure on the site that remains today, and it weighs about 30,000 pounds. That came from that fault line, you know, they actually mm -hmm. were able to pull a 30,000 pound stone out of there. That's just pretty, pretty interesting. Oh, it's fascinating beyond words. Yeah, it's incredible. And, mm. and how deep did you have to dig before you hit the bedrock? Uh, it varies all over the hill. Actually, um, we had a uh, New Hampshire, is, uh, New Hampshire Archaeological Society president joined us in 1989 uh, for one project, and she got involved right after that with uh, doing a series of shovel test pits, STPs. It's a, a hole about 50 centimeters across, and you just go down to the hit bedrock or glacial soil. And she was a president of the Archaeological Society. Her husband was a doctor of geology from Tufts University. He was there for 30 years, so she had a really good geological uh, background, plus, you know, an assistant. Her husband could help her out on anything geological. And what we were interested in is 4,000 years ago, what did this hill look like? Was it forested? Was it bare? You know, all bedrock? Mm -hmm. And she did about 90 of those holes, and she found that some of the fire pits. She found the workshop. She found the uh, wigwam site. Uh, she said that 75% of the hill probably was bare 4,000 years ago. It was a fairly open hill with some vegetation, with some earth, but it wasn't covered like it is today. You know, it's very slowly getting covered by windblown soil and vegetation decay, you know, about an inch every 100 years. So, um, so it was probably a pretty big open hill. And that's why they made all these underground drains. I think they didn't have soil to absorb the rainwater and the snow melt, so they channeled everything. They knew that ahead of time. Mm -hmm. And they also had, they had a good view of the alignments, too. You know, they didn't have all the trees in the way to watch the sunrise, sunset, and moonrise, and moonset, and all of that. Right. Highly so, educated. Uh, yeah, it's pretty neat. Some areas of the bedrock still exposed up there, 
like they call them sheet backs. Um, if you visit the site, you still see some bedrock exposed. And because on the main site, some of it was exposed, but Mr. Goodwin and other people actually, you know, dug down and cleaned a lot of it too, you know, so some of that's still exposed from the 1930s. But uh, there's erosion going on up there. So somebody would say, well, if this site was 4,000 years old, it should be buried with, you know, 20, 10, 20 feet of dirt or something. But being on a hill, there is a accumulation of soil, but it's also erosion. It's washing down too at the same mm-hmm. time. So it's a slow process up there. Of soil, yeah. soil, soil buildup. So mm-hmm. your question, yeah, from no uh, no soil with exposed bedrock to some areas probably have several feet, you know, where mm-hmm. the bedrock kind of, the, the way the bedrock shape, it could be a couple feet of uh, dirt there actually that accumulated, you know. Wow. Yeah. And what about burial mounds? Have you noticed anything in association with a burial mound or a possible place? Well, we have found a couple of cairns on the west side, uh, probably halfway out to the cliff area. They, a couple of Two cons, and one of them has like a monolith in the middle of it standing up, a short monolith, which is kind of neat. Mm-hmm. And the other, the other con has kind of a, I don't know, the, it's, you know, con is kind of a pile of rocks, you know. Um, they're all over the world, you know. Sometimes they use the trail markers, sometimes they use these monuments, and I've seen them in Europe, kind of the megalithic sites, you know. Mm-hmm. And we're not sure what their function was. They might have been monuments. Uh, they could be burials, you know. And so we don't know what these are. They're out there to the west. They have been looked at, but they haven't been completely, you know, taken apart to see if there's anything inside of them. I will say the soil in New England is uh, very acidic, especially in New Hampshire. We have a lot of pine trees, but there's a lot of acid in the soil. So anything like bones or anything like that, a wood or anything like that, it not only rots, but it dissolves very quickly into the soil. And I was told by the president of the Hampshire Archaeological Society, you can find bones sometimes a few hundred years old and maybe up to a thousand, but that's being pretty lucky, and it depends where they're located, you know, what type of soil, uh, where they're located, uh, if they're protected by a shelter, if they're in clay kind of soil, it depends, you know, but bones in New England generally a few hundred years are gone, you know, they're back right. into the soil again, you know, they disappear. So. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Um, but wow. The, but, but the chambers but the chambers could have been burial chambers. We have chambers that are shaped like some of the burial chambers of some of the 50,000 megalithic sites in Europe. Uh, we have a couple like the Bee Hut, shaped like some of the wedge tombs, which I saw over in Ireland with my dad back in the early 80s when we traveled over there. And the wedge tombs uh, size and the shape looked like our Bee Hut. It's an interesting structure. And I always wondered why it wasn't facing, because the rest of the site's facing north, south, east, and west with the walls and the openings. Mm-hmm. But this, this particular chamber, the Bee Hut, I used to sit there, and I was a guide up there in the early 70s, and I'm like, why is this thing facing? It kind of faces the winter solstice sunset, but mm. why is it facing that way, you know? And when I started reading more about other sites around the world and the megalithic sites, we came upon a description of a wedge tomb uh, in a Time Life magazine uh, book, actually, a really nice book about megalithic sites. And the wedge tomb sounded like our bee hut, the shape of it, the size of it. But the wedge tombs of Ireland always say southwest, and it's faces southwest just like our chamber. So size, shape, and orientation mm-hmm. were the same on both sides of the ocean. And mm-hmm. they were used for tombs over there. Uh, you know, they, they believe they were burial tombs. Right. Um, but yeah, right next to our uh, okay. bee hut is a east, east-west chamber, and it looks like the gallery graves found in, they're found in northwest Ireland and found in France, which I saw when I went to Karnak. Uh, they're also in Holland. They have a, a Dutch name I can't pronounce. But they're um, kind of, they always face true east and west, not magnetic, true east and west. And they run 20 to 60 feet length approximately over there. And ours fits right into that. It runs east and west. And when you look at the way the stones are stood on end and then the roof slabs on top, it's kind of a long, skinny chamber. And over there, they were used again for burial purposes. And they're called Gallery Bridge, you know. And mm-hmm. it reminds me of our Swiss chamber. Yeah, very, very much so. Wow, that's fascinating. Mm-hmm. And what about the uh, Gunky? Is it Gungi Wump? Is that contemporary or later? Uh, the Gungi Wump site, big question. That was in Connecticut, right near the uh, Navy base in Groton. Uh, it's about a 200-acre site. It does have a few structures that are a little bit similar to ours, and some of the walls have some standing stones that are sort of remind you of our site. Mm-hmm. Um, but they believe that, that site might be, I think, from the datings I've read about that, somewhere around the 6th century A.D. And our site, going back 4,000 years, would predate that, you know, by what, about 2,400 years, or, uh, uh, let's see, uh, about, uh, yeah, about 2,400 years, I think, something like that, 2,500 years. Wow. So it's a later site, we think. Uh, I don't know if somebody was there 4,000 years ago doing something, and then later somebody used it, but it appears to have been built at a later period of time, actually, around the 6th century, I think. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I believe this puts you on the radar insofar as the inaugural season of Scott Walter's America's Unearthed, because he actually um, 
he actually did an, an interview and actually excavated over there to some degree, didn't he? That, yeah, he's done a stuff. lot of uh, yeah, he does a lot of research, a lot of exploration, you know, and then the, in and then he talks to uh, specialists, you know, like engineers and astronomers mm-hmm. and people that study inscriptions and all that. And the show is really good. I mean, if people agree or disagree with some of his ideas. He does show that what these, site, these sites do exist, you know, they're out there, and then, you know, what are they, how old they are, and some of the controversy surrounding them. Uh, where we went to school, you know, through elementary, high school, and into college, you know, you really don't hear about these these structures, you know, they're well-kept secret. And I don't think they're all root cellars, as some people think, or historic structures. Oh, no way. <laughs> Not that way. Yeah, I don't think so. No, I think, yeah, I know, exactly. But then you want this is a really neat site, I think. Our site's probably the oldest megalithic site that we're aware of in the Northeast, possibly in America. But uh, Country Womp uh, covers about 200 acres, but it's a little more thinly, you know, uh, spread out over the landscape. I think we still have more structures in Country Womp, but it is a really neat site. It's probably the second in size to our site that I'm aware of. If you travel up and down the Hudson River, though, in Westchester County and Putnam County, New York, uh, there's about 200 what we call megalithic type sites. It's the highest concentration in the Northeast. And I, when I was in uh, Ireland, north of Dublin, to see Newgrange, Nelton Belt, and some of the other sites up there, they have about 200 in the Boyne Valley, north of Dublin. So it kind of compares. It's very similar to, so you, you know, you talk about high density of megalithic sites. It would be up and down the Hudson River and open Ireland. It would be on the Boyne, the Boyne Valley on that river, you know, mm-hmm. uh, about 200 sites in each one. So they're very similar in that way, you know. It's fascinating. And there's so much that we still haven't uncovered over there. I mean, when you think about it, it's such an old area and so historical on many levels. So it's really fascinating that uh, that you've been bringing this to light, and I'm very appreciative of that for certain. And also, did you ever excavate or find any underground tunnels, I mean, or caves? I, I suspect you have some kind of caves. But what about real deep tunnels underground, anything like that? Um, well, which is the biggest structure, you know, on the site. Um, we, but I'm not sure. Sh- well, the ground penetration radar, we did run it over the chambers, too, again, to see what they look like on the radar. And this is in the mid-'90s. Now they use, used to have a, um, uh, they had a monitor with a hood on it, so you could actually see the monitor and keep out the sun. Now they use laptops, and it's very, very powerful software they're using. And mm-hmm. The equipment, the hardware has improved the software. I've been told, because uh, the company has moved from our being in our neighborhood, downtown, the same, the same town we're in, but they moved about six miles away, so we don't see them uh, like we used to. I get a few of the engineers over once in a while, but I'd love to have them back with their equipment. Because now they say if, if it's like a, if you had a spear point or something like that in the ground, you wouldn't see a bunch of city lines. The software would actually recreate it and say, oh, there's an arrowhead on the screen, you know, that kind of thing. I guess it's got brief, from what I understand, I hope I'm not incorrect, but I think they actually, you can actually see the image come up on the screen instead of a bunch of zigzag lines that you had to interpret, you know, and that mm-hmm. takes a lot of training, you know. I think it's uh, it's like x-ray vision almost now, I think. And so we haven't really used their equipment for 20 years, but it would be really wonderful to. But what they found to the west of the site about maybe 200 feet from where the chain link fence area is, that one acre area, was a large uh, area. They said this is a cavity in the ground. We thought it was solid bedrock out there because the, bedrock, the whole hill split bedrock. Mm-hmm. And they said below us there's a cavity. And then they ran the equipment over it again and again because I said, I think this is supposed to be solid out, rock out here. And it probably goes down 15 miles or whatever. Uh, talking to geologists, you know, just solid rock. And said, no, you should do a, a test bit here. Cause, and they ran it. It was about the size of that chamber in ruins, approximately that size kind of a cavity. They said it's either geological or archaeological, but you should check it out. And that was in 1995. And we haven't had the time, resources to get back and actually go down and see if, in fact, there is a uh, chamber there. So it's mm-hmm. one of those things uh, on our bucket list, you know, we want to do. You know, so, oh, absolutely. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That, that would be fascinating yeah. to do that. And I, I think you're right, too. There could be some mining um, that was done there as well. That could be a high possibility. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's possible. You know that um, there was ancient mines up in Bell, uh, let's say, up in Lake Superior, uh, Isle Royale, I guess. They found a lot of the 500, was it 500,000 tons of uh, copper removed up there. And that kind of is part of the whole theory of people coming from the old world across the Atlantic Ocean, bringing goods back to the new, to the old world, you know, mm-hmm. um, and things like copper, you know, and all sorts of other things like furs and, and silver and different things like that that they might have been bringing back. It was during the time of the Bronze Age, from the Neolithic actually going into the Bronze Age. Mm-hmm. Um, and one of the theories is the Phoenicians were the ones that were coming over here. Uh, Phoenicians, Libyans, and Celts, actually, they found those type of descriptions from up in Canada, down to South America, and then out to, like, Alberta, Canada. They found these markings, thousands of them, you know. 
Mm -hmm. Um, And, uh, you know, are they hoaxes, fakes, misinterpretations, or are they or are they actually the results of ancient people coming to the New World before Columbus or the Vikings, you know? Right. And leaving mm-hmm. their mark. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's quite fascinating, without a doubt. And also, uh, Mark was noticing, I get texts here and there, but but the summer solstice sunrise, which appears in a notch in a hill about four miles away, can you elaborate on that and also about the cross-quarter days? Yeah, that's right. Um, that's how, okay, yeah, the, uh, the astronomical lines, I think, are one of the, one of the more interesting things uh, on the site, I mean, I love the whole thing, you know, the geology, the archaeology, and all of that, but the, in the inscriptions, too, but the uh, astronomy is really fascinating. I took that in college, too. I took electives in astronomy, and my, uh, my, my professor was coming for decades with the students after I had him for a teacher. I made him aware of our site, and he came up, he just retired recently, but we do get other, other colleges of astronomy groups coming. But the site was probably a religious site, and they set up these stones. And Mr. Goodwin in the 1930s was even aware that these standing stones were out there. Um, he had bought about 15 acres of the hill. And today we have about 110 acres. So he only owned a small portion of it, including the main site. So some of these standing stones weren't even on his property. But his main focus and his attention was on that one acre area of the site. And one other chamber called the Watch House, which is actually one of the satellite chambers. And a couple other things outside. But he was aware of the standing stones. He just didn't have time to look at them. And he... He probably heard of Stonehenge in England. I'm sure he did. He was well read and he was well traveled. He was an insurance millionaire, but um, and he worked in Indian Mounds out in the in the West, you know. And he was looking for where Columbus landed and where did we Erickson. So he was really involved with all of that. Um, and he was even aware of the uh, ancient megalithic sites of uh, Korea, which I only became aware of in the last uh, ten years. I wasn't aware of that. He was in the 1930s, so he was well read. But um, it wasn't until the 1960s that we actually started looking at the astronomical alignments. It was because of a show called Stonehenge Decoded on CBS, uh, which came off the book um, Stonehenge Decoded by Gerald Hopkins. And he thought Stonehenge was a big computer. And that book was a, a really big seller back in the 60s and 70s. And um, he thought Stonehenge was a computer for predicting different events, like so, um, not only the solstices and equinoxes, but also in the uh, quarter days and cross quarter days, but the lunar minors and lunar majors, rise, moon rises and sets, and probably predicted eclipses. So the book is very popular, and the TV show actually got my dad's interest in some of the other researchers said, gee, these standing stones out here, and some have fallen, but you can see the big, they were standing at one time. Maybe they were aligned uh, like Stonehenge, you know? So they began looking at that around 65, and in 67, they began clearing out some of the forest so you could actually see sunrise or sunset. In 1970, all, a bunch of us went up, to, about five of us went up on top of the hill on the winter solstice, and the weather finally cooperated in 1967, 8, and 9. The weather wasn't too good. So by 1970, we went up there and we actually photographed, and the weather was beautiful. And the sun set right over the winter solstice sunset. And we felt at the time maybe we were the first people to see that in, you know, possibly thousands of years, you know. The last time somebody watched this was way back, you know, in time, right. you know. Yeah. So we thought, well, we have a uh, winter solstice maybe, and then we started opening up some of the other ones uh, through the late 60s into the, uh, the 70s. And by 1973, we said, well, we will have to hire a professional surveyor in order to, uh, to make this uh, project go forward. We had to know exactly where these stones are, whether they actually are aligned with the sun, moon, and any stars. So it was about a four-year project. We uh, raised money, and then we hired the surveyor to come in, and then he would do his work, and then we bring him back the next year when we raise more funds. So it took a couple of years for him to do all the alignments and walls on top of the hill. We sent that information to the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. And again, as I mentioned earlier, they said, well, if, these were astro- if the site was used for astronomical purposes, it would work about 1800 BC. Mm-hmm. So we had the uh, summer solstice, winter solstice, spring and fall equinox. And the cross quarter days are days in between. And today they've moved some of the days to like November 1st, which is um, All Saints Day. It's mm-hmm. right around Halloween. Right. Uh, May 1st, which is Beltane, the fires of Beltane. And uh, August 1st and February 1st, which is uh, some people uh, celebrate as Candlemas, Groundhog's Day, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. But they all have Celtic words. They're all, the ancient Celts celebrated these, and they're actually more important than the four seasons. Mm-hmm. Cross quarter days were a big, big deal, you know. So we have those. So we have the uh, four seasons. Those cross quarter days actually are the beginning of the seasons, like May 1st is the beginning of, beginning of summer. And when you get to uh, your June 21st or June 20th, that would be midsummer. We call it mm-hmm. the first day of summer day. But you also can see midsummer, you know, written right. down somewhere. Like middle of summer. I thought it was the first of summer. And then August 1st, we have an alignment there, stone that aligns with that. We just had that recently. And that's the beginning of fall. 
September 21st or 2nd would be fall equinox. And the end of fall beginning of winter would be November 1st. And Halloween, All Saints Day, All Souls Day, some of the modern holidays have been Christianized. Mm-hmm. And then that's the beginning of winter. And then midwinter's, you know, December 22nd or 21st, depending on the year. And then the end of uh, winter is February 1st. And that's the beginning of spring. And then we get to uh, March 22nd, spring. And then again, back to May. You know, May Day was the beginning of some years, as a matter of fact. And some calendars, that was the beginning of the year, not January 1st. So we have eight parts of the year, and so they're cross-quarter and quarter days. We have stones for that. Some of these stones are over 10 feet tall, uh, and one of them, as I mentioned earlier, is a 14-foot monolith. It's pretty large. Mm-hmm. Um, we have the lunar alignments. The moon goes through an 18-and-a-half-year cycle, and Stonehenge has that feature. Nice. Um, and uh, a couple of many other sites in Europe, too, but Stonehenge particularly, we know Stonehenge. Our site has that. And uh, we have the uh, true north alignment with Polaris, the pole star today. But because of the Earth's the processional cycle, it's just 26,000 years. 4,000 years ago, the Earth's axis, the North Pole, was actually aimed at a star called Thuban, or Alpha Draconis, the brightest star in Draco the Dragon. Mm-hmm. And the Great Pyramid of Cheops in Egypt is facing, that shaft is actually pointing towards Thuban, today it's towards Polaris, uh, due to the processional, due to the Earth's tilt. It does that little wobble like, you know? Mm-hmm. So, um, so it changes, very slowly changes, you know. So the astronomical thing is really important because it helped to date the site, too, just like radiocarbon dating. And the inscriptions, too, uh, according to Barry Fell from Harvard, the inscriptions go back, um, you know, he gives a kind of a time period of when these inscriptions were done, too. But he thinks the site was used for quite a while, for many, many generations, you know. Mm-hmm. And, Absolutely, yeah. yeah it's heard, like a pagan site, too. Yeah. I mean, you're talking... Um, you know, in alignment with, with obviously pagan ritual to some degree. So, yeah, that's really fascinating. It's, it's highly symbolic, if you ask me, insofar as what they were doing in, in ceremony and their correlation between the stars and the sun and the moon. And, it definitely and, is, yeah. That's, the site was definitely that. Definitely as a spiritual site. It might have been a place where people were buried, perhaps, and place where people might have been, uh, you know, had weddings, mm-hmm. uh, maybe possibly births, you know. But there's a table there. It's one of this table, a sacrificial table, um, is one of the main features on the main site. It's shaped like a very well, it's shaped like a bell, kind of a bell shape, and it's very large. It weighs about nine thousand pounds, and it's about nine feet by approximately six feet. And on the top surface is a groove that's been carved deeply into the stone. It's uh, rectangular in shape, and it has a little runoff or a little spout that goes off right below the spout with a whatever fluid or whatever, when it rains out, it still works. The, the water would drip down that spout. Right below there is actually cut out in the bedrock where either the water could go into the cut out in the bedrock or they could set a base there or something to collect, you know, whatever fluid there was, you know, blood or whatever. Mm-hmm. So the table, we're not sure what its function was, but some people suggest it was a sacrificial table. Others say it's ceremonial. Mm-hmm. Um, it is a really interesting feature, and we know where the stone came from. We identified it where they actually cut it out of the bedrock. It's right below where the astronomical center of the whole site is. Uh, oh. We don't know if that's intentional, but after that stone came out of there, they built two cairns, two piles of rocks, two more cairns. I mentioned others that were to the west of the site, hundreds, you know, maybe a thousand feet out there, but uh, we don't know what the purpose of those cairns are. But these two were photographed, diagrammed by Mr. Goodwin uh, by and photographed by Malcolm Pearson. And uh, unfortunately, Mr. Goodwin thought they were beehive chambers connected to the, the largest structure we call the oracle chamber. He thought they were kind of attached to that. But as he kind of studied it and started removing some of the stones to look at it a little closer, he found that it was not a hollow chamber. It was solid rock. Both mm-hmm. of them were side by side. And he didn't know what they were, so he started dismantling them, using them to repair some of the other structures, unfortunately. And um, in 19, uh, late 60s and early 70s, we started, as I mentioned, uh, surveying the site, we found that that was the astronomical center, and those two cons actually were the actual two points where all the alignments came together, and Mr. Goodwin, 40 years earlier in the 1930s, actually destroyed them, you know, unfortunately, so... Oh. Wow. That happens, you know. Yeah, <laughs> that, it does. It does happen, so. Oh, yeah. Yep. <laughs> and it's interesting how they came to the conclusion it was sacrificial, the table. And what kind of vibe do you get off of that? I'm thinking more ceremonial and maybe something alchemical versus a sacrificial where, where you're, um, you know, where there's blood and all this and that. But what, what's your impression, energetically speaking, of that table? Boy, I'd like to know, you know. Um, I don't even know if there's any testing it's been exposed to the elements possibly for thousands of years you know mm-hmm. and we don't know you know if any modern technology or some future technology would be able to detect 
if in fact there was a sacrificial table, what did they sacrifice? And will any of that show up with some modern techniques, you know? Mm-hmm. Like uh, they, they, they use that lumen, what do they call that? Lumen, whatever. Oh, luminol? Yeah, prime scene. Well, that would be yeah, that's it. Yeah, I don't know if it would be effective yeah, on the rocks but, or not, but yeah. Interesting. Yeah, exactly. And, and something that old, too, you know, thousands of years of rain, snow, and sun, and everything else on that, and people walking on the table, and, you know, it, and the top surface is actually, you know, it's um, actually, Scott Walters is a geologist, of course, and he was looking at it going, yeah, there's erosion going on on the table, too, you mm-hmm. know, just from time, you know, it's just, it happens, and, you know, he was suggesting different ways of protecting the table from further damage, you know, just from time, and, you know, frost, and rain and mm-hmm. snow and ice cause damage to it. So is there anything left on there from somebody doing a sa- sacrifice? We don't know. It could be a ceremonial table. Mm-hmm. Um, it's very large. You know, some people suggested it was a cider press. Um, there's no there's no um, evidence the patties were doing anything like that on the on the site um, as far as making, a, you know, apple cider or cloud cider or anything like that. Well, that sounds uh, good. We, have the tax, we actually had the records of the patty. And he was a tax collector, too. He was a... He was um, a shoemaker. Uh-huh. Um, his, grand- his father was a shoemaker, and great. There was five generations of shoemakers. And then um, Jonathan's one we talk a lot about. He, um, he his grandfather bought the property. He might have built a house there. And then his name was Seth. And then there was Seth Jr. And then Jonathan. And Jonathan, or one of them, actually the one that the quarry went up there destroying the site. So they built the house there, but there was a lot of structures around them. And it was said three years in a row, cop- quarrymen came up and took cartload after cartload of rock away from the hilltop dismantling the site, so rather than building it, they're actually tearing it apart, you know, which is, which is too bad. Right, really yeah, awful. they tend to do that sometimes. You know, it's interesting, I was thinking what, what comes to mind also is maybe harvesting, um, maybe maybe it was some place to, um, you know, the table was used for maybe some kind of harvesting, um, I'm not sure, I don't know if they were, but they were growing over yeah. there, but you never know, right? I think you're on the right track, though, because, you know, it would, if, um, you know, the, uh, the astronomical calendar would have been very important for holidays, but also early in time, man wanted to know migrations of animals, fish, birds, you know, and different types of uh, land animals. And then later on with uh, agriculture, it would have been nice to know when to plant the seed, you know, you don't want to plant mm-hmm. it too early or too late, and then harvest. So um, that would have been really an important thing. Um, we don't know what these people really ate, you know. We don't know, you know, or they do they have any kind of crops or you know, where the hunter gatherers, and that would have been a time that they would have been around 4,000 years ago. Um, agriculture was just starting to come in. It was uh, 4,000 years ago was actually the end of the archaic period uh, in, the, in the Northeast. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's paleo up to about 10,000 years ago, roughly, and then it goes into the archaic period. But suddenly the archaic period, what they call the maritime archaic or red paint, Indian, I guess, is one term they use, or the Laurentian, which is more up in Canada or into New York, that tradition suddenly came to a stop. And, they, and I was just reading recently that they still don't know why the archaic period ended. Um, they're baffled by that. You know, why did it, you know, could it be something climatic? Could it be somebody from overseas coming and disrupting their lifestyle? And it would have been a change, you know, mm-hmm. where one civilization meets another. It's a possibility, but they still don't know. You know, the mainstream archaeological establishment as well. About 4,000 years ago, these traditions came to an end and it changed into the woodland period and then ceramics came in. And some of the pottery that's been found at our site, some of the uh, researchers during the 60s and 70s noted a comparison to some of the uh, pottery found in Western Europe, you know. And mm-hmm. I don't know what the verdict is on that or how, what the jury's going to say on that. Um, they, I think that's gotta, they've got to do more research and study on that to see if there is some similarity between that. Mm-hmm. Um, down in Ecuador, this pottery 5,000 years old that was brought in from uh, Deptian, and Betty Megas from the Smithsonian, she was here for decades. She was one of the leading researchers in the Smithsonian. She just passed away recently. But she even came to some of the um, uh, meetings of a group my dad started in 1964. She came more recently. The group's been around for 50 years. She came several years ago. And back in the 60s and 70s and 80s, you know, you wouldn't get the mainstream archaeological community too interested in these. They just thought a lot of the researchers were a little bit crackers, you know, a little crazy looking at these stone structures. There's nothing to them or any of the inscriptions or anything else. But Benny Magers... uh, they actually, not just in New England, but all over the Western Hemisphere, they thought that we were isolated from the rest of the world until Columbus came. Mm-hmm. Um, by 1963, they proved the Vikings had made it to, made it to Bonzo Meadow, Canada, um, and they're so reluctant to say that you know the Vikings had much of an impact. 
or that other explorers may have preceded the Vikings, you know, to the New World, anywhere in North, Central, or South America. But they found this pottery uh, down in Ecuador that's like uh, pottery from Japan 5,000 years ago, and it actually evolved in Ecuador. It actually changed over time, you know, like the style and everything changed. But it paralleled with the time. So some people said, well, maybe some fishermen got blown off course 10,000 miles from Japan, ended up off Ecuador, and they left behind this pottery. And But the problem is it kept evolving the same way it did in Japan. They think it was continuous contact back and forth. That's a theory, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not fact yet, but it's a theory. But they also found um, the, some of the mummies up in the... Uh, Andes in Ecuador are well preserved, and some had a type of leukemia form uh, caused by a son of a very one of uh, one of the causes. One type of disease is very rare, and they identified that disease. I guess there's different diseases, but this one's very rare. They found it was back in Japan too. So they're bringing not only the um, the pottery, but also a disease across the Pacific. Apparently, you know, mm -hmm. so they're able to identify it that way too, which is really interesting. It's another way of showing people in contact with one another, you know, so exactly. people coming across the Pacific, across the Atlantic, you know, before oh, Columbus. Absolutely, and it makes you wonder, too, if there was, obviously there would have been signs of some kind of a battle or something if, if there was some kind of a squabbling that was going on um, between cultures at the site. You would have you would have seen some kind of a, something there as a remnant, wouldn't you, if, if there was something like that going on? Yeah, and we only excavated about 1% of the hilltop, but you're right. Um, you think you'd find some sort of, so a lot of people come up and say, oh, you have these, the, the walls do cover the, the hill. They're all over the hill. Some, you know, these walls are very extensive. And some people suggest they're, you know, useful fortification, you know, against mm -hmm. the enemy. But we just haven't found that yet. You know, maybe uh, if they were able to excavate the, and, and excavations are destructive. You know, once you dig something up, you know, future mm -hmm. technology can't be used in that dig. And that's a problem with Mr. Goodwin. He did really clean the site pretty well in some of those chambers, like the bee hut, the east-west chamber. He cleaned them right to the bedrock. So, if he had left the material in there, a little bit of it, we could take it out, send it to a laboratory, and if we found certain trace elements, we could say, this is a burial. There's chemicals in here indicating it was human burial, mm -hmm. you know, with the modern technology. But also, maybe uh, somewhere out there we'll find, you know, some some uh, ed um, evidence of um, weapons, you know. We do have um, some stone axes. Uh, we have adz axes. We have hammer stones, rubbing stones. Uh, and these are found in the uh, in the site. People say you don't have any artifacts. We have actually hundreds of artifacts, thousands of artifacts found on the site. A lot of them are stone age, hammer mm -hmm. stones, rubbing stones. We have points. We have stone knives. Um, all sorts of things that have been found in the dig, particularly around that um, uh, that dig in 1967, 68. I'm sorry, 67, 69, and 71. Uh, they found all sorts of tools in that particular excavation, which mm -hmm. is pretty neat. Oh yeah, it's fascinating. I know. I know. Uh, Mark. Hi, Mark Eddy. I'm just saying hello to you because he's a wonderful guy out there. Um, he keeps teaching me information. But, but let's go ahead and go with this. Um, so, so he's talking about the stone circle between the main site and the summer solstice sunrise stone. That there may be another one, and there are stone walls too. So, so what was the purpose of that? The stone walls. Yeah. Uh well, the, the summer solstice sunrise is a really neat one. Uh, the stone is, has a kind of a slope to it. It's asymmetrically shaped. Most of these standing stones look like arrowheads with a point in the center, but this one has a slope to it. We, we identified it, you know, in the, uh, I guess during the 60s and 70s, we cleared out the avenue to it. And when we finally opened it up so you could see the horizon, we noticed that the top of the, the shape of the stone on the top of it, the slope, actually fits into a notch of two hills that come together on the horizon at about four miles distance. And um, we call that a horizon feature. So they actually shape the stone, the top of the stone, to fit the notch. And if you go back towards the site about halfway uh, during the 1970s, they found the top. The, the very top of the stones are sticking through the stone. It's an ellipse. It's a st actually a stone circle. It's an elliptical shape. Mm -hmm. And right dead center of it is another stone where you, we believe you'd actually stand. And the elevation is correct. So you'd stand there and look at the top of that uh, the, uh, summer solstice sunrise lawn, a or stone. And the sun will rise about 90 degrees to the slope of it. At the same time, you're looking at the top of that stone, you're looking at the notch in the horizon four miles distance. So you have not only your position at the top of the rock, and then you even have the horizon feature, and then you have the sun all lined up. And uh, it still works today, although because your tilt's off, it's, it's right. You have to actually move yourself a little bit to make it work because your tilt is a little different. That's good because it was perfect. And then it was set up recently by Mr. Patty or somebody, you know, but it doesn't. It doesn't quite work today. Um, and if you're looking at that, 3,200 miles distance, you're looking, you, if you could see it, you'd be looking right through the center of Stonehenge to the, uh, the, the you know, the trilithons, the large tall stones mm -hmm. that form the horseshoe. And you're looking right dead center right through that. 
Wow. My son Kelsey discovered that by Google Earth about three, a little over three years ago, and that's why uh, uh, it got a couple of um, investigators very interested, and they got a hold of Scott Walters, who we, we had met before. You know, he'd been to our site probably 10 years ago or a little less than 10 years ago, but we were familiar with Scott and his books. Mm-hmm. And um, so they were just putting this TV show together, and so we became uh, one of the priorities to come out and film us, and they filmed us for six days. And uh, we didn't know him. My dad had passed away just a couple of years before that. He never knew that when you were watching the summer solstice sunrise, you're actually looking at Stonehenge 3,200 miles distant. It's actually lined up perfectly with Stonehenge. We never knew that until uh, 2012. No idea at all. It's fascinating. I saw that episode, by the way. It was fantastic. Yeah. yeah. You know, is it a coincidence? Or, no. You know, and if, it's, you know, if it's not a coincidence, how would they do it? My son had some ideas on how they could actually do that how they could do that across the ocean, but I don't know. I just know it's pretty neat. You know, if it is a coincidence, it's really a pretty cool coincidence, you know, that it's right in line with Stonehenge. Right. I don't um, believe in a coincidence now. That's that's something uh, yeah. very advanced. That's fascinating. Incredible. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, some people believe in ley lines, you know. Mm-hmm. And, uh, Absolutely. The sites, and, and it's kind of neat because the sites do, uh, and I guess Alfred Watkins, I think, in the 1800s, uh, going back even a little bit earlier than that, people looked at it and said, you know, some of these sites seem to be in straight lines with one another, you know? Mm-hmm. And they started researching that and taking it, you know, further and further away uh, out across Europe, you know, and finding these sites seem to be in line with one another. Uh, the argument would be the 50,000 sites, so you're bound to have sites lined up. But some are precisely, so precisely lined up, you wonder if they can be a coincidence, you know? They're right. Right on the money, you know, mm-hmm. right in line with one another, one after the other. My son did, uh, it's preliminary, he's got to do a little more work, and you can make errors, obviously. All you have to be off is just a little bit, and 3,200 mile, 3, miles, you can miss England altogether, you know, if he was, you know, making the line go out, and he just was a slight error of that, you know, just, mm-hmm. you know, as you're doing it. But what he found is true south of us is a uh, effigy mound in Andover, Massachusetts. It's a really cool structure. It's on private property, but it looks like a turtle. It's a, you know, uh, it's a created of all these stones, just like you would expect to find out in Ohio or Indiana, one of those effigy or Wisconsin, you know, those effigy type mm-hmm. mounds. It's right, right true south of us. But if you continue down into South America, uh, that alignment goes right by Machu Picchu, you know. And uh, he's going to do a little bit more um, research on that to see how close it does come to Machu But it, it looked like it came right over Machu Picchu. So somebody wow. else can do some more research and check that out. The mm-hmm. summer souls, uh, the winter souls to sunset goes right by Tihuacan, um, which I visited a couple uh, with my dad back in the 1980s, uh, kind of just north of Mexico City. It goes right across that site. I think the Moon Pyramid, actually. Mm-hmm. The Sun Pyramid, the Moon Pyramid, I think the Moon Pyramid. So, and so they had to just, you know, step back and say, well, it could be just a coincidence, but these astronomical lines do seem to be aligned with things more locally in New England, but also things, you know, thousands of miles away. I agree. I don't so, think it's a coincidence uh, at all. Not at all. Mm-hmm. energetically speaking. No, no way. It's fascinating. And also, um, let's see here, the inscribed stones that were deciphered by Dr. Barry fell, that, that there's a petroglyph of an Ibex old world deer in the Oracle Chamber. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, uh, Dr. Barry Fell first visited the site in 1975, and he's from New Zealand. He went to school, I think, uh, in England, and he came to Harvard. He was there for uh, 20 years or so. And he first visited us like 1975, and then he passed away, I think, around 1994. So we knew him for almost 20 years. Uh, the, um, there is a copy in the Oracle Chamber. The Oracle Chamber is a really fascinating chamber, too. Um, it, it runs about 30 feet approximately north and south, and then it has a, a east wing that goes off about uh, 18 or 20 feet. It has corbelling in it, like you can see in some of the old world architecture over in, you know, Scotland or Ireland, that kind of thing. It's really neat. Mm-hmm. It has stone seat. It has a stone bed. It has the oracle tube. It's a square horizontal tube that goes about eight feet, uh, and it comes out underneath the sacrificial table from the oracle chamber. And right down below the, um, the oracle tube, inside the oracle chamber, is a step. So if somebody was around five and a half feet tall, roughly, you know, plus or minus a few inches. You can stand on that step, and you would be the correct height to yell through this tube. And there'd be no other purpose for it. It's not a smoke tube, you know. It would be vertical. This thing goes horizontally about eight feet. And when Mr. Goodwin was researching the site, they didn't know that existed there. Um, actually, the table was all buried up to the top with dirt, so it had been many, many years of soil very slowly, you know, filling in around the table. He thought it was sitting on the on the ground. And when this workman started, he had a team of uh, workmen, and he had a... MIT engineer that was actually directing the whole thing, 
But as he went down, they found the stone legs, and that was a big surprise. They didn't know it was actually a table. You know, mm. it was just a big rock laying on the ground. It went down further. Um, somebody moved a stone, and it came out of the wall, and that was where the oracle tube is. Somebody had actually plugged up uh, not only the, the pod underneath the table, but also inside the oracle chamber. So when you first went in there, you would never know there was an oracle tube. Somebody actually took time to put plugs in both ends of them to conceal that, you know, uh, keep it secret, I guess. Right, that's and, very interesting. Um, and, and Dennis, what? Oh, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry? No, we were going to have for a break real quick, and we'll come back and finish up on this, but I want to take a break real quick. Everybody stay tuned. Dark Matter Digital Network, my special guest, Dennis Stone.